Welcome back to the channel guys, T Gill here, back with another video and another installment of Historian Reacts. Today we're going to be looking at part 2 of Between Two Wars, uh, 1918. Um, this one talks about disease, war, and the lost generation. Um, so, I do have a couple other videos planned for either this week or next week, a couple oversimplified videos. Um, those videos tend to get more views, they are a little more entertaining. Um, have that uh, little comedy aspect um now the between two wars series is very informative i do like it i'm not going to watch all of them uh, like i said in the previous video there's like 58 of them or something like that um and that's just a lot of time to, to deal with it but i am going to watch some here and there um probably out of order but that's neither here nor there so i guess let's stop talking let's just get into the video what a great still the simplest thing I can say about the Spanish flu is this. Spanish flu. Deadliest pandemic, barring, um, I think it might have been deadlier than the COVID pandemic. I know it killed like 600, over 600,000 people just in the U.S. The Spanish flu did. I'm not sure about the world. I'll have to look into that. It killed more people in a shorter period of time than any other disease in human history. I'm pretty sure this was made. Well, let's check. Welcome to Between Two Wars. Okay, yeah, before the, the COVID pandemic. Years, from the uncertainty and hedonism of the 1920s to humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. Speaking of the Second World War, I, I should make a video on this. I watched a video yesterday um, about a guy who claimed that World War II never happened and conspiracies on why he didn't think it happened. And I, I don't know, it's mind-boggling. It's the most documented event in human history. But yet people still don't believe it existed. It's crazy. As the nations that fought the Great War lay down their arms, there's something else going on that further colors a world that was unquestionably a world of absolute disaster. In the autumn of 1918, the Spanish flu reaches its highest this level of quality. infection and mortality. 1080p. The flu has quickly spread all over the world since the spring. Okay, infection comes in waves. The first wave in spring was already bad, but this second wave is absolutely devastating. Yep. September and October are the worst months. Well, let's see how many people died in the world. How many people died in the Spanish flu? So 675,000 in the U.S. Fifty million. About fifty million. So then let's compare that to COVID. See with COVID, three point five million. The U.S. having the most at five hundred ninety four thousand. Crazy. It really is. But I guess modern medicine is kind of a, a blessing then. I, you know, attribute it to modern medicine really in science and how what we call the deadliest pandemic wasn't not even close to the deadliest pandemic killed less than uh 10 percent single day of september and october 1918 more than 300,000 people are killed by the disease it's so widespread that there is no one that isn't affected in some way those who themselves are spared still have to deal with close friends and family dying. Everyone all over the world is- I was reading a statistic just then. It was like 0.64% of the U.S. population at the time died. It's a lot of literally people. Literally, the entire world population. It's hard to even imagine what that does to a world already so broken. And the second wave is followed immediately by two more waves lasting into the spring of 1919. Then a final wave of infection strikes in autumn of 1919, which leaves people dying into the first months of 1920. 
in the end, we don't have exact figures on how many people died from the Spanish flu, but we know it killed at least 40 million and maybe as many as 100 million people worldwide in 18 months started. So his figure is 40 million, mine was 50. So I guess there's that gray area of, uh, you know, give or take a few, a few million. But even then, up to 100 million, that's a lot of freaking people. That would have been almost the entire U.S. population at the time. Starting in March 1918, that's up to 1 in 20 of the world population. There was nowhere on the planet that was safe. It reached the frozen wastes of the Arctic and the remote Pacific Islands. As a comparison, the population of Spain in 2018 is around 46 million people. Imagine if every single person in Spain, man, woman, and child, died in under two years, and you get an idea of how many lives were lost to the flu. Now, a lot. in terms of mortality by percentage, it was not the most deadly disease we've ever seen. Uh, the Black Death, for example, which ravaged Europe 1347 to 1351, though it originated in Central Asia in the 1330s, killed an estimated 23 million of Europe's roughly 72 million inhabitants in that period which is roughly a third of the population. But we hadn't seen anything like that for centuries by 1918. Sure, there was, there was malaria, which overall killed more people through the years, and smallpox, which killed hundreds of millions of people between 1900 and 1950. But the rate of people dying over just that two year period, coming on the heels of the First World War, made it really seem that one way or another, the world was coming to an end. Aside yeah. from just the death toll, which was three to five percent of the global population, the flu infected some 500 million people. About a quarter of the world was infected and it killed up to 20% of those infected. Whereas a normal flu has a mortality rate of just 0.1%. Unlike most flu outbreaks that primarily kill the very young, the elderly or the sickly, a huge proportion of those killed by the Spanish flu were healthy young adults. One explanation which is 100% the opposite of how COVID uh, acted. Um, healthy young adults were some of the least affected um, by it, and then older people are the ones dying. For this, is that death is caused by a cytokine storm provoked by the flu. Now, this is an overreaction of the immune system to a pathogen. Cytokines tell our immune systems to fight the invader and an exaggerated response to an especially virulent pathogen in, say, the lungs, can lead to respiratory failure. A cytokine storm is the result of a healthy and vigorous immune system. So the stronger immune systems of young adults, when confronted with the flu, ravage their own bodies, while those with much weaker immune systems saw far fewer deaths. Also, a study... It's weird and kind of ironic, because you'd think having a strong immune system make it a lot better for you but apparently that just wasn't the case with the spanish flu published in the scientific journal pnas in 2014 shows that children born in the years just after 1889 were never exposed to the kind of flu that struck in 1918 which left them uniquely vulnerable while older people had been which gave them immunity those researchers did okay that kind of makes sense kind of a herd immunity um sense Okay, yeah, I guess that does make a little more sense, but it is still kind of ironic. When they look back at the dominant flu strains going back to 1830, there was an 1889 world outbreak called the Russian flu, the H3N8 virus, which left that generation of children unexposed to an H1 type virus like the 1918 flu. Those letters and numbers, by the way, refer to a flu's protein. Starting in 1900, there were seasonal outbreaks of H1 type flus that the study claims provided partial immunity to children born after 1900. And all this could explain okay. why adults aged 18 to 29 were basically the hardest hit. The Spanish flu, despite its name, did not originate in Spain. During 1918, when the flu spread among the armies fighting the war, wartime censors minimized the spread of news about it to maintain morale. Spain was neutral though, so the newspapers there were free to report on the epidemic, and the media in the warring nations was free to write about its effects in Spain, which created the false impression that it originated there, thus giving rise to its name. Now, if you're wondering exactly where it did originate, 
Well, there are several theories. Many say that the first confirmed outbreak was at Fort Riley, Kansas, and that it was American troops that were first infected and who brought the flu to Europe with them. That's the theory I'm most familiar with. Um, I'm interested to see what the other one are. British virology investigation in 1999 places Etaple in France, near the battlefront, as the center of the epidemic. Yeah, that right there would get you sick. Give me keys. And postulated that a precursor virus among birds migrated the to bird pigs flu, huh? kept in the region and from there to humans. It's another one that I've actually heard is that it came from pigs. I, I thought it came from pig farms in Kansas, but apparently it was the troops. I don't know. I guess we'll never know. Dr. Claude Hanoum, the leading Spanish flu expert for the Pasteur Institute, hypothesized that the virus came from China before mutating in the U.S. and spreading to Europe and the rest of the world. While he thought... There's a um, pattern with China. Um, it's theorized um, and pretty much confirmed that the Black Death, the plague, came from from Central China uh, or from Central Asia, um, China. Um, then obviously, um, COVID is from the Wuhan region of China. Um, then apparently the Spanish flu. Thought it was possible that which it's it's very very possible that it that it could have. Um, I don't like to dog on other countries and stuff, but China is a very dirty place. China and India um, are very dirty. They have pretty much always been. Um, and it's just because they have so many people. The populations are so big. Um, and unless you live in a rural area, it's awful. Disease originated in Kansas. He did not think it likely. Also, just a few years ago, historian Mark Humphreys found archival evidence of a respiratory illness that struck northern China in late 1917 and may have been spread to Europe by the... Right there, there's more evidence of it, so it's kind of weird. 100,000 men of the Chinese Labor Corps during the war. A 2016 report from the Journal of the Chinese Medical Association, though, found no evidence that the virus was imported to Europe from East Asia, and actually found some evidence that it was already in circulation among the European armies before the 1918 pandemic broke out. Whatever the case, it was catastrophic, and the close quarters and massive troop movements, as well as the new access to modern transportation systems, quickly spread it everywhere in two strains, one before August 1918, and one after that was far more serious and deadly. There are those who argue that the flu was one thing that tipped the balance in the war in favor of the Allies. And it's true that there is data that the Central huh. Powers were hard hit before the Allies were, and that mortality in Germany and Austria was higher than in Britain and France. I can't say much about that, though, even as a World War I historian myself. On November 30th, 1919, health officials will declare the Spanish flu pandemic over, though deaths will continue into the spring of 1920. By the end of 1919, the flu has killed more people in 18 months than the World War did in four years. A world that had just been devastated by four years of total war, a world that was just beginning to rebuild itself, had to do so against a background of millions upon millions of people dying of disease. The impact of the war, the flu, and all the sorrow that followed would be be far-ranging. You'll think of this. Most of the people fighting and dying in World War I were men born between 1889 and 1900. Most of the people that died from the Spanish flu were born in the same time frame. An entire generation has just lost up to 100 million people right when they... I never looked at it like that. That is a lot of... That, that, that's like a whole generation. That's... It's gone. Come of age. Oof. That's around 18% of all the young adults in the world wiped out in less than five years. Also, the proportion of males lost is significantly higher because of being soldiers. So think of it like this, right? You start high school in a class of 33 students. By the time you're all supposed to graduate, six of your classmates have died from the flu or been killed in the war. Now, not only that, in the next classroom, the same numbers apply, and in the next, and in the next. So in a school of, say, five high school classes, one entire classroom has been killed. 
and also in every other school, in every other country, in the entire world. Shortly after the war, the novelist and patron of the arts, Gertrude Stein, will name this generation the Lost Generation, and they are already generally considered decadent, dissolute, and irretrievably damaged by World War I. Her protege, the author and journalist Ernest Hemingway, and the next generation to get a name, or a good, um, decent name, is the greatest generation, the World War II vets. Himself born in 1899, popularizes the term and will write several books seminal in describing the hopes and pains of his generation. His debut novel, The Sun Also Rises, published in 1926, is based on his own experiences and those of close friends. Hemingway explained that he's trying to show that although they are a lost generation, the suffering and loss has also made them resilient and strong. Hemingway turns out to be right, because in the next 20 years, this very generation will redefine the world and give birth to modern times as we know them. The suffering will lead many of them to work for the improvement of the world. The change in demographics will also contribute to women gaining more rights as they assume traditionally male activities and roles in society. The new outlook will also give birth to completely new forms of modern art, design, and music. But many of that generation will also descend into desperation, fear, and hatred, turning to extreme ideologies like Nazism, fascism, and communism to find answers. Uh, there you go back. Mussolini. Mussolini, what are you doing? ideologies like Nazism. Look at you just said the funniest joke in the world and he's waiting for everyone's reaction. Look at that face. What a horrible man. Fascism and communism to find answers, leading to more death, suffering, and ultimately to an even more destructive world war. Joseph Goebbels, Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh, Benito Mussolini, Hideki Tojo, and Adolf Hitler were all part of the lost generation. But for now, that's all in the future. And as you shall see in our first episode about 1919, there is still hope and improvement as wartime innovation starts entering. Oh, and the, the video there, but let's go back to the camera here. That's a very informative video. Um, it, it's surprising that so many people died in such a short amount of time. Up to 100 million um, lost. Um, it's a lost generation for a reason, I guess. Um, it is crazy to think that a lot of these leaders who would form Nazi Party, the Italian fascists, um, the Vietnamese communist parties, we're all part of this generation. Um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird, but it, it makes sense. You know, they, they're fighting for what they believe in. Um, they felt the world failed them in some way, and they were trying to do what they thought was right. Doesn't mean that it was right, especially with <clears throat> Hitler. Um, that man is a stain on humanity. So I guess I'm going to end it here today. Um, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe for more videos. Uh, like I said uh, at the beginning of the episode, should be having another video out this week at some point, um, looking at oversimplified Napoleonic Wars um, videos. Um, so until next time, peace.